So welcome to the Ucast. Uh, thank you so much for being here today and being with us. Uh, Pete, Diana, uh, very happy to welcome you on our on our Ucast podcasting experience. Uh, so um, first, uh, we'd like uh, to welcome you here and uh, and uh, Diana, if you can um, uh, introduce yourself. Sure, happy to. Uh, my name is Dana Baumeister. I have a couple of hats. I'm co-founder and partner at Biomimicry 3.8, which is a B corporation that works with uh, companies and cities and organizations to bring biomimicry to their field, to the work that they do. I'm also a director of the Biomimicry Center at Arizona State University and a professor of practice there. And uh, we have uh, the world's first master's degree in biomimicry um, at ASU. And um, so yeah, I balance both of those hats and spin a bunch of plates in between. Great, welcome. And uh, Pete, welcome on board. Uh, if you can uh, introduce yourself. Sure, hi Florian, hey Dana, uh, hello everyone. So I'm uh, uh, Pete Fikusik and I've been working in the area of uh, biological photonics or natural photonics at the University of Exeter since about 1998. We published our first paper in this area in 1999 on the morpho butterfly. Currently, I'm, the, I'm a professor of physics at the University of Exeter, which is in the southwest of England, of the United Kingdom. Uh, I, uh, have, I'm pretty passionate about science communication. Uh, I've done a lot of it over the years with all over the world, and I've, it's been sort of the highlight of the last 10 or 20 years in my life. Uh, I'm currently the uh, Vice Dean for Education at Exeter University. I have a strong kind of interest and passion towards ensuring our regular students, notwithstanding bio-inspiration, bio-memory, but our regular students at university are supported and gain a valuable and worthwhile uh, educational experience. So a lot of education, uh, a lot of kind of science, photonics focus, but uh, just really interested in the natural world with respect to appearance and color and optics and functionality in that area. Great. Well, thank you for this and uh, welcome. Uh, so I'd like to start by asking uh, both of you, um, for you, what, what is biomimicry and uh, how it relates to people's day-to-day -day life? That's a great question. I'd, I'll give two answers. Um, we have sort of the, the formal communication stage answer, and then probably maybe the second half of the answer is what does it actually mean, right, for, for the world? Um, we refer to biomimicry as the conscious emulation of nature's genius, and those four words are actually pretty carefully chosen. So conscious implies intent, that we actually make a choice to go out and ask the natural world for advice. You know, how do we figure out how to do things differently as a species? How do we innovate? How do we design? How do we create? How do we build? How do we connect, communicate, whatever that verb might be? And um, we go in the mindset as a student. Um, so we are asking our teacher, nature, uh, how we might go about doing that. Um, the emulate is also a really important word. It's, it doesn't translate very easily into other languages um, because it's not copying. We're not talking about creating a direct blueprint of nature, but rather drawing upon those, um, what we call the, the abstracted design principle. What's the, the lesson behind that that we can then um, emulate and bring to our designs? Uh, you know, we'll never be able to 
build a helicopter that flies like a mosquito, for example. I mean, the laws of physics will never allow that. You can't do a direct one-on-one. -on -one. But we can learn from the relative angle that birds flip up their wingtips and uh, design airplane tips to similarly flip up in order to increase lift uh, and uh, therefore decrease fuel efficiency or fuel consumption in planes by learning from large birds. So that emulate is also really important. It is not copying nature, but borrowing those lessons. And then nature's genius is based on the premise that, well, she's been around a heck of a lot longer than we have, you know, um, as, as a collective. Um, of course, we are nature, but we're a relatively new species on the planet. We've only got about 300,000 years under our belt compared to 3.8 billion years that all of life has been on the planet. And um, from our perspective, there's some inherent genius in that, especially since we're looking at species that have... Um, or are withstanding the test of time, right? They, they're evidence of what works and what gets to stay. And uh, when we consider that 99% of all species have planet, um, in the planet's lifetime have gone extinct, the remaining 1% or less than 1%, there's probably something that works. Um, of course, there's some bad luck for a good chunk of the remaining 99% like asteroids and whatnot that have hit and taken them out. But um, so there's genius in that, right? And, and that genius comes with a sense of humbleness is we are young, we're toddlers, you know, please help us figure out how to, how to live here. And um, that quieting our cleverness gives us the opportunity to, to really learn. So in a nutshell, biomimicry is um, looking to nature for these ideas that we can bring to our our world and, and a way of living. And I, I think the, the second part of that is the implications, therefore, mean that we actually might get to stay as a species on the planet and not go extinct. That perhaps part of our evolution of our large uh, forebrains and our ability to mimic, to learn from others, um, might be a, the most important adaptive strategy that we have in terms of figuring out how do we live here well. So that's a, from a regenerative perspective, uh, you know, when we ask ourselves and we see as a species we're in peril, uh, perhaps this is a path forward to help us, to help guide us on what it might mean to, to stay. Great. And you, and you, Pete, what do you, how do you relate to that? Well, <laughs> I got to be honest, Dana, I, I don't think I could ever match that for a, an all encompassing, marvelous kind of first class description. So, so Florian, really in answer, I would, I would defer to, to Dana's just epic answer there. The only way I suppose that I could contribute it in a way that reflects my perspective relates to adding one small component or really focus, not adding, that would be wrong, focusing in on one small component that sits within the envelope that Dana described in relation to um, a, a steer. So, so in, in the optical community in, in which I work, one of the things biomimicry wise, bioinspiration wise that, that we tend to benefit from or play towards is the steer in a certain direction that arises when we look at a particular system. Uh, in, in my group's case, an optical system. Um, so that steer may not necessarily include a particular shape or structure or design of a system, but it may be, well, you know, this particular animal, this particular insect wing or, or reptile integument actually is demonstrating this type of an overall effect. Um, and at the core of this overall effect is one minor set of components. Now, what happens if we add a different material to those components? What happens if, and nature doesn't do metals very well or semiconductors very well, as an example. So what happens if we take this wonderfully involved, very adapted design that facilitates certain functions in a certain environment Let's, let's throw some gold particles at it. Let's throw some semiconducting material at it. Where might that then take us with respect to a, a function or, or a deliverable device? 
Um, so it's it's a bit of a nuance, I suppose, but w within Dana's marvelous envelope that, that she described, I suppose the my focus and my group's focus and much of my end of the of the um, of the topic focus would be all right well where can it take us where can we stand on these shoulders and adapt it as it were a bit of human adaptation adapt it to the ends that we know we will need um, and that can be multiple multi-varied uh, so I'm not sure if that really answers the question or really <laughs> contributes positively to Dana's wonderful uh, answer. Um, I, I, d I have to confess as well to, to being a, a bit of a typical kind of scientist in that I'm a bit more inward looking than I should be. I, I naturally know that I should be looking outwards much more. But to be honest, some of these systems are just so beautiful in their own right that I find myself and, and we in my group, we find ourselves reveling in the, the scientific majesty, the, the structural majesty of these things. Uh, and we just get wrapped up in, in that moment. Um, I think were we more competent biomimicists, bio bioinspirationalists, bio <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think we would, we would be looking outward. We'd be looking to take much more frequently what we learn and what we discover, let's say, and we'd say, okay, well, where can we roll this out? Where might this provide a benefit? Peter, you said like 18 things that, that I, I could see as, as conversational direction, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, and it's really actually why um, I thought it would be great. And, 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 I, and I put out the name, let's, let's talk to Pete, because I think that would be really fun, because I think um, there's there's some really interesting, important parts of what you contributed to the definition that I think are relevant, you know, to, to think about from a conversational point. Um, and maybe I'll start with the, the last piece and, and work backwards. It, your, your piece about as a scientist looking inward is precisely why I agreed when ASU called me seven years ago and said, we, you know, we'd like you to come here. Um, but it's also why I refuse to go fully to the university. And, and one of my goals in connecting in the university space, especially Arizona State University, which is a huge, huge university, 3,500 faculty, um, is to try to provide that bridge, that outward looking bridge of, of this research is amazing. This is so cool. Thank you for head down, you know, looking into these details. Uh, and what is the world asking for? What does the world need? And what does that look like? And, and how can we bring um, that research? Uh, and I really appreciate, and it's probably why I've noticed your work, that you have that interest in science communication because too few scientists do, right? And, and, the, and the work gets stuck in these peer-reviewed academic journals that only somebody else with the same credentials could actually read. Um, and being able to translate that into a form that the world can see and notice and be able to say, I want that. And would you please do this for me now too? Um, I think is, is a huge missed opportunity, especially in the field of biomimicry that, um, that we're trying to figure out how we can open up that space and build those bridges. Yeah. Um, Florian, I, I, let's perhaps be led by you a little bit about which of these many avenues you'd, you'd like us to go down because, you know, we could just talk for, I'm sure, hours. Yeah, is there, is there, so so over, over to you really to, uh, to kind of steer us. Exactly. Yeah. No, I, I was happy actually to see you guys interact on that. I, I didn't want to, uh, to, uh, to change the party. But uh, so by sharing your experience, like I can see that, um, that something that is very important for you guys is to think about how to apply all this thinking, this system thinking that you guys have been developing. And uh, I, I'd like you to tell me, like, what do, why do you think biomimicry is important for resilience? For like, because like, it's something that is like, like more and more, um, it's a very, very strong subject right now with what's happening with the pandemic and like climate change. And like, I, I'd like to hear you about the relationship between biomimicry and, uh, and um, 
uh, movement and resilience. Well, maybe you could tell me how you define resilience because um, there's a biological definition for resilience and, and we definitely think about it. It's one of our life's principles is, is nature embodies resilience. Um, but I'm curious what you, what, what you mean by that so I can be sure to respond appropriately. Yeah, what we mean by that is uh, the ability to, uh, to produce anti-fragile systems that are able to thrive uh, collectively uh, through time. So that's mm -hmm. uh, how, I would, how I would define that and how we're thinking about that. Uh, yeah. As we are actually like trying to apply biomimicry to education and we'll get to that point mm -hmm. after. Well, so... So we have a set of principles that we call life's principles, and um, and I, I imagine that that Peter in his, your work too, you especially since you know so much about biophotonics that you've you've seen these patterns that appear over and over and over again, and life's principles are the patterns that we see occur across all of life, like or let's say ninety nine point nine percent of life. There's always an exception, and over the years we've honed these and we've got. 26 of them and we developed them and or, or parsed them I should say as a way to help guide if you don't have time to dig into the biology or whatever and learn lessons about what does it mean to live well on this planet let's ask everybody all at once and see what their answer is and um, and one of the life's principles is about embodying resilience and for for organisms I don't know that we would call it anti-fragility, but rather it's the, the need or the ability to maintain critical functions, all right? So, you know, I can breathe, I, my heart can pump, I can, I can um, consume food, you know, those, these are all critical functions. Um, in spite of or in light of disturbance, right? Some sort of disturbance. And the only thing that we know about disturbance uh, that we can confirm and guarantee is that it will happen, right? But we don't know what kind of disturbance, what size of disturbance, from where it will come, and how we manage, you know, what, you know how it's going to affect us. So all of life over the years, over the, the millennia, has developed strategies for resilience, recognizing that's going to happen, but we don't know much about it. And it does so by building in three particular responses. One is to have redundancy in, their, in the system. So um, like, let's take our immune system because it's especially pertinent in the pandemic. Our immune system has many, many, many white blood cells. It has many, many, many T cells. It has many, many, um, you know, uh, different kinds of actually, there's several different types of white blood cells. And th that redundancy is important because we don't know if we're going to be hit with one bacteria, one virus particle, but we have many, there could be many viral particles. So we have to have redundancy in a system. Um, the next thing life does is it has diversity because we don't know, are we going to be hit with a virus or a bacteria or a fungi or, a, you know, an open wound or whatever it might be. So our immune system has to have a lot of different types of cells in order to be able to respond to um, whatever may come, in this case, a disturbance of, to our immune, our, our health. And so we have diversity, we have redundancy. But we also have to be decentralized, right? So those things need to be um, moving throughout the whole body because we don't know, is it going to be a cut on the hand? Is it going to come in through the nose? Is it going to come through the mouth? Is it going to be something we ate and comes in through our guts? Um, and so the, for all of those critical functions, life builds in um, redundancy, diversity, and decentralization or distribution. Right? And um, so for me, that becomes a deep design principle. That's why it's a life's principle that we then need to apply to all of our systems. So if it's how do we protect our water for a community? Well, if you only have one supply, one source of water, and it's only located in one place, and even if you have a lot of it, you've missed two of the three critical pieces, and all it takes is 
I don't know, a landslide that fills that lake in or an algal bloom that makes the water in a hospital and then suddenly the whole community is without water. So if we need to have water resilience, then we need to have a diverse way of uh, getting our water. It needs to be decentralized and we need to have plenty of it so we can afford to lose some of it, right? And you can sort of systematically go through all of the different things in our world. And so for me, what biomimicry offers for resilience at the highest level is that big lesson, right? Like that big design principle. But then just as biomimicry offers to any other challenge, as we get more specific, well, how do we have a diverse array of ways to store water, well, let's look at all the different ways in which life stores water, and that can give us lots of options, right? So you could get into the weeds in terms of the questions you would ask for the specific challenges you were trying to solve. But here, Diana, I hear you perfectly. I think those three principles are key, actually, yes, to this design. Uh, but I, I'm wondering just something, like if it's so natural, like something that feels like that nature has always had, and like why don't our rational mind don't get it? Like, why people don't get it? <laughs> like. Well, that's a whole other set of questions, right? So, I mean, part of it is that's one of the 26 life's principles, right? So we can't, and, and no organism can put all of its eggs invest in solely in resilience, right? You also have to invest in the other things that are also important. You have to invest in being locally in tuned and responsive, which is one. You have to be invested in feedback loops, which is another one. You have to be invested in evolving to survive. You have to be invested in adapting to changing conditions. And I could go through all 26. And so, um, we know, for example, our brain is a really critical function, but we only have one of them, right? And so over time in our evolutionary history, we have not adapt had the need to develop an adaptation of multiple brains because the kinds of disturbances that we've been faced with haven't um, demanded, if you will, that adaptation. We've you know, developed a really hard skull because probably the biggest risk to the brain is tripping on a rock and, you know, and, and getting a significant bruise. And so we've, we've developed things like balance and we've developed a skull. You know. We've developed other ways to protect that, but we haven't built in into the brain as a critical function, for example, those things, because we had to optimize other things. Like we had to fit through the birth canal. So we had to, you know, we had, there's, so life has a huge, game of um, optimizing rather than maximizing. And so I think for humans, why we may not get that one piece is because we've over leveraged or over emphasized some other aspects of, you know, of our lives and the things that we are, we're doing. Great. It's, uh, it's uh, interesting what you said because of these 26 principles, because I, I would have naturally believed that um, like resilience would have been the combination of all of them. Of the yeah, no, I wouldn't. I would say it's not. I mean, it's everyone is critically important, right? So if you're missing any one of these, but if you let's say if you don't have feedback loops, if you don't have the ability to detect what's happening in your environment and respond appropriately, all bets are off, right? Like, forget it. You're just never going to survive on the planet. You're done. You know, so that may be just as important as being resilient or any of the other critical life from principles right and uh, Pete when um, like like hearing all that like uh, could you please like share more about the like work and uh, how it relates to that um, yeah it, it, thank you so uh, all of what Dana said just now really really resonated I suppose the one area and the, the word that resonated the most was optimization or optimizing. Um, and the picture and the area in which, which my guys work is, is pretty narrow. So we, and, and these systems are, are multifunctional. They serve many purposes. They, they endure and live through many different forms of selection pressure, which contribute to their evolutionary trajectory. Um, but with respect to the optical system, the appearance or anything that 
Yeah, yeah. I suppose the word appearance is to a larger extent the the local area in in towards which we look. Um, optimization is an interesting phenomenon. So, so I could I could say with the same breath that the morpho system is really highly optimized. And by that, by that, I mean the more the blue morpho butterfly. That's you know the the subject of many books, and you know we all see them and we love them. And um, so we could say that the morpho butterfly system, for example, is really highly optimized. And in the same breath, I could say, well, actually, it's not very optimized at all. And let me explain what I mean by that. So, the the bright, brilliant blue iridescent color that has evolved on the uh, on the dorsal surfaces of these male species, they are optimized perfectly, arguably, for signaling to other males over long distances. Okay, you know, and I don't think many would argue with that. However, when we look at the microstructure associated with the the wing scales that that are the seat of the color, you know, it, it doesn't need a it doesn't you don't need to be in the field for for 10 years to know that actually there's a lot of there's a lot of poor engineering there you know and i, I use that that those two words poor engineering with inverted commas you know these systems are not perfect they are strewn with errors and missing scales and inexact layers that create the interference of light to 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 reflect the blue I mean, in, in a one sense, if, if a technologist was tasked with delivering a highly reflective blue system to be used for long distance signaling, he or she, if they delivered this system, the Morpho system, you know, they'd be laughed off the street because they're so, relatively speaking, imperfect. Um, yeah, thank you. They're beautiful, beautiful things. However, it, it, it all depends on the perspective that you take to to understanding this word optimizing. So sure, they're optimized for long distance signaling. Sure, they're not optimized in a technological sort of yardstick comparison. However, what we can learn from them especially, and this is where the field is beginning to go on the optical side of things, is that these guys have done and do just enough to get the job done just enough, a male is just enough or, or, or has evolved just enough periodic multilayering in their wing scales in order to produce just enough of an intense signal that is focused in just enough tight, just a tight enough cone for it to be able to, um, to attract or rather to scare off males and thereby attract it more than its fair share of females on its hilltop. Um, so the idea, I mean, I suppose it's, it's a little phrase we, we might care to talk about. Um, these guys do just enough to get the job done, just enough to serve the function. Um, and in doing so, they tick the box. Um, so, so the phrase optimization is a really interesting area to talk about, actually, because, you know, let me repeat myself come from two minutes ago, because these guys and beetle systems and colored systems that we've studied, you know, they are optimized, yeah, really highly, but at the same time, you know, in a sense, they're not optimized. Um, it depends on your perspective and it depends on your yardstick. And, I, and I, what I think is really important in this is what we will call the difference between a local optima and a global optima. Right, And so every species has its evolutionary baggage. I mean, the butterfly still has to fly, right? It still has to, and it doesn't have gold dust at its fingertips, right, in terms of its design. And as you said, it doesn't need to be perfect because it's accomplished what it needs to accomplish. Um, it reminds me of the, the Japanese work of Wabi Sabi, which is like beauty in imperfection. And uh, it's, it came about in Japan because of, they actually found there was so much waste 
in the craving towards perfection, right? If you think of like the perfect apple and the perfect packaging and all these things that were discarded. And so trying to say that good enough, it's still a pretty damn tasty apple, even if it's not perfectly round um, or whatever it might be, uh, is part of, and to me, the lesson that comes from the morpho, well, one, that's one, right? Like let's find the beauty and the imperfection. Uh, what is good enough? But also, can we create a structural blue without the use of any um, toxins or heavy metals? And can we use this incredible thing? It's it, part of what's important about structural color is that it's permanent, right? So all those mounts that we just saw on the screen, like those, those butterflies are dead but yet they still have this brilliant blue. So you didn't have to add uh, energy, you know, food or, or cell replication or whatever to create that brilliant blue. And we know, uh, and this is why I talk about your work, Pete, in, in the work that I do, is we know that the use of heavy metals um, and uh, for creating color is a huge problem in the fashion industry, especially. And we also know that the issues around fading is why so many things are discarded and, and gotten rid of because a color has faded and it, you know, it no longer has the aesthetic. So if we could figure out ways, as the Morpho teaches us and, and the Beatles and many other structural color um, examples from nature, how to create permanent color without the use of the chemistry um, the toxic chemistry that we're doing, then so for me, when I think optimize, I'm looking at that whole system because at the end of the day, when that butterfly, it, you know, is say discarded in the, on the forest floor, every bit, every molecule turns into, you know, something else that is, that is healthy, right? It's not something that is going to poison us. So part of that optimized system, it's a whole system of which structural color is one of the gifts. Um, but so from a, a place of regeneration, we have to go about meeting our functional needs, meeting our, our aesthetics, our optical needs, and whatever it might be in a way that ensures at a systems level, we are optimized to fit in on the planet, right? We're optimized to not poison ourselves, right? Yeah, I, I like what you what you guys described uh, by that because actually it's um, in a certain way it connects with this idea of a, of kind of a, the, the pleasing sobriety of the blue morpho butterfly is just doing enough to be within that that uh, that range of uh, of uh, of color right and uh, and uh, the fact that it can keep it forever it's uh, very very strong in that. Uh, idea of structural color, and um, Pete, can, can can you share a bit more about what is structural structural color? Just for pe people who are not familiar with that uh, that idea. Sure, uh, I'll do my best. Certainly, the uh, arguably uh, color generation is divided into three kind of categories, three groups, or the generation of color stems from one of three mechanisms, principally. Uh, the most common mechanism, for example, the the green of grass, the the blue of blueberries, that derives the, the brown of skin, where skin or hair or eyes are brown, um, that derives from pigment. And pigments tend to work through the selective absorption of photons of particular bands of visible light. Um, sometimes a pigment is a fluorescent pigment, which is a sort of a subgroup associated with color generation where ultraviolet is absorbed and then visible light is emitted. Uh, a second group by a mechanism by which color is produced is, I suppose, described by, um, uh, it, well, uh, let me give you an example. You know, the kind of the standard light stick that that roads people play or the, the army use or some schools use to demonstrate uh, light. So that is bio or chemiluminescence in a light stick, uh, bioluminescence in a, in a natural system where two chemicals mix uh, in an exothermic reaction that instead of producing heat will produce visible light. So those are the certainly um, 
conventional pigments are the by far the most common mechanism by which color is produced. Uh, chlorophyll is a pigment, melanin is a pigment, anthocyanins are, are pigments associated with the grass, the green of the grass, the brown of hair or of skin, um, or the blue of blueberries. Um, so the one that I haven't described so far and which towards which we're moving is a non-pigmentary type of color and that tends to be referred to as a structural color and that is produced by the interaction of light waves reflected from usually uh, structures on a surface or structures in a surface. Um, the most simple system of which and the most well-known of system of which produces structural color is a film of um, soap, uh, either on water or a film of oil on a puddle of water. The reflection of light waves from the top surface of the film and then from the bottom surface of the film, they will additively produce a bright color if the thickness of the film is, is right, or they will destructively produce, uh, or rather they will additively produce no color if the thickness of the film um, uh, is, is slightly different. So a, in the same way that a film of soap or a film of oil produces a spectrum of colored light in reflection, as a result of the different thicknesses of that film, a film of cuticle, insect cuticle, uh, will produce a colored reflection as well. Whereas a film, of, a film of soap solution is a single film, evolutionary processes have led to the, in, in insect wings, in, in some mammalian systems, in some avian feathers, they've led to the stacking of many films, as this particular picture shows. It's an electron microscope image, I think, of a morpho scale. Yeah, there's a classic morpho retina scale cross-section. Um, so the tiny layers of those tree branches that we're seeing on screen right now, they are the equivalent of the soap films. And it's the multiple reflection from those soap films which are tuned by evolutionary processes to be of a particular narrow range of thicknesses. They give rise to the interference of light in the case of Morpho to produce a bright blue reflection. And of course, if you change the thickness, you can tune or change the reflected color. And that happens wide, widely uh, uh, across the visible spectrum for different species and different colors. Yeah, and I would add just a little bit to that when I talk about it is what blue is the most common um, that we see as structural color in biological systems because the wavelength for blue happens to correspond with about the level which life has the greatest ability to tune those layers that Peter was talking about. Whereas red is a much longer wavelength and it's pretty hard to build the cellular structures um, that can tune to that layer. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Pete, because I would love to know if I've been explaining it wrong all the time. But um, I find it fascinating that blue is so common and that often things like a green frog is a combination of a structural color blue and yellow pigment um, that is actually doing a little bit of the, you know, magic paint making. But I, I would love to be corrected if I'm incorrect here. No, 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 no correction needed whatsoever, Dana. I think the only thing, Florian, that I would add for the broader picture is that um, the, well, as, as Dana alluded to earlier, many of these things have evolved under multiple selection pressures. So it's all very well for, I suppose, scientists like me to think, wow, this is a beautiful blue. Of course, it's evolved blue for its own purposes to do this and that. However, if it, let's say it's an intraspecific communication vehicle. In other words, if the blue of the morpho has evolved principally to, to help communication with other morphos, then we have to remember that not only it's the wing color that's important and which has evolved, but also it's the visual system of conspecifics that have evolved in parallel as well. But where intraspecific communication is not the key driver, 
if it's interspecific communication. Let's say, let's say a particular tasty beetle evolves a color. Well, that color might have evolved in parallel or it may have waged a war with the visual sensitivity of a predator too. So there are all these sorts of selection pressures which impose um, the, the evolutionary direction or control and manipulate the evolutionary direction. We, and my group certainly looks predominantly at appearance. However, we have in our back of our minds and other groups look directly at visual systems. You know, they are a, a complicated, if arguably even more complicated, uh, biological system. Um, but they are very important in a discussion about the purpose and the role played by coloured wings, coloured feathers. Um, and we mustn't forget that, I think. I, I understand that um, like lots of, lots of your... Of your research like you're like looking at how it can uh, also apply to products and how you can like connect it um i like uh, do, do you see any um application that can be regenerative or that can be like connected to this idea of, uh, of regeneration um i'm not sure if that's an area in which i have much strength or, or much industrial experience um, again, I, you know, I'm 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 a sad scientist in a in a dark room for most of my life, but it's very rewarding and very fulfilling. Don't get me wrong. Um, the, the the thing I'd like to flag, and it may or may not be connected to what you've just asked, is that increasingly, work from from many groups is pointing towards um, a tolerance. So the the phrase fault tolerance. So. I, d I describe this idea that, that, you know, some of the systems we look at are not optimized at the same time as being optimized. Well, they're not optimized because there are lots of faults. There are lots of kind of mistakes in the, in the layering, l let's say. Um, you know, one, one can see those as mistakes or as imperfections. Let's use that phrase, that word. Imper you know, these systems are imperfect. However, and here's the big thing that I think will be useful going forward for many areas of technology. Um, the systems that have evolved tolerate these imperfections. And they not only tolerate the imperfections, but they thrive on them. Now, if there's a lesson to be learned, that is a good lesson. It's interesting what you said about this thing of, of imperfection, because it's, uh, it's actually like... Um an important uh, part of that. And actually, it's not easy to... Uh, but part of the, the vision behind the peer-to-peer -peer movement is actually to accept this idea of imperfection. It's like it's connected, it's, it's functional, but not necessarily it's, it's perfect when it's, uh, when it's coming out. And, um, and I think it's... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's really... Uh, it resonates uh, with us on, in that sense. Before you go on a different direction, I want to ask a follow-up because I... You said something, Pete, that I think is really interesting. What what I heard in that, and I'd love some clarification, is the what you what I heard fault tolerance, right? And so, having worked with a number of companies, and you know, watching their manufacturing processes and so on, there's a lot of energy invested in um, quality control, if you will, and and an assumption that you know it has to be perfect in order to go out the door and what i heard you say in there or, or i you know casted forward was if we can prove in 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 optical systems or whatever that good enough is is good enough that 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 that, that we can have more tolerances in our in our accept and not just like I'm not just talking about the psychological acceptance, but rather the functional acceptance that the product actually will perform even if you haven't tuned it to that absolute level, um, which I think is really interesting in terms of you know energy consumption and material consumption and and waste management and and really the investment. It's like telling uh, giving engineers permission to not be perfect, um, but because. For all, for the outcome, will still be, be will still achieve what we want to achieve. Did I hear that correctly? I hundred percent. You you summarized that better than I even described it or tried to describe it myself. Yeah. So, the the idea of turning out a product that isn't perfect, but 
which is good enough to do the job with some margin. You know, I think that's, that's, that has been, well, I hesitate to say that's been missed so far. I'm sure some really clever people have seen it, and but maybe I just haven't read about it. But the stuff that we've looked at in the optical systems is pointing more and more to this. Maybe we are a bit more experienced or and maybe the, the glasses with which we examine these things are, are a bit more nuanced now, but that's exactly the message that seems to be coming, you know. And if we can produce a technological product for the mass market, which is just good enough and which people accept for being good enough while doing it, serving its purpose, then the product will be cheaper. There should be less waste. Um, all of those things that go with it. I have to share a quick story as we're talking about um, making these connections. I, uh, I was uh, uh, giving a, a lecture at Philips Electronics, which is the lighting company, right? They make all the light bulbs. And I had a room full of, you know, PhD engineers. And, and one of my first goals when I show up at these is to um, remove the pedestal from on which they stand, right? Like, so they've been very proud of all the things they've accomplished in their life. And, and, and just, just to add a little bit of humbleness to the room, because I need them to be open and consider what, uh, what nature might offer. And so I actually tell them one, a story about you, Pete. And, and I say, in the, in this case, I, I tell that story. Um, and I, I show the LED light bulb that was patented in 2001, the new cutting edge LED light bulb that some MIT engineers, I think, came up with. And they were so proud of it because it would reduce the energy consumption. And, um, and what, you know, wouldn't this be a great, so much brighter for so much less energy. And it has a Bragg's reflector and a photonic crystal at its heart. And I must have read an article in which you were, were interviewed or something, and you said, that's all well and good, but here's the African swallowtail butterfly um, that uh, has this brilliant, brilliant, I think it was green, that's this brilliant reflection, and it's been for 50 million years or something, and look up close under a microscope. It has a Bragg's reflector and a photonic crystal. <laughs> and, um, and then my point to these engineers was, if you had only asked, right? If you had only asked first, we may not have had to have waited until 2001 um, to come up with this, you know, this amazing LED light bulb. And, and then I use that story that I'm telling you now also in other rooms, right? Because it's just such a, 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 a very perfect perfect way to say that we need to open up our eyes to the possibilities of what we might learn if we're willing to to ask including things like tolerances right yeah yeah dana so i'm i'm just so touched and honored genuinely that that you would use that story so thank you for for sharing it yeah yeah well thank you for telling giving me the opportunity to sell it yeah tell it and that's good because it connects directly with those um, millions of lead bulbs that we have around us here in brazil so mm -hmm. that's right so uh, that's right. Um, actually i um what do you think of the, to go back uh, to biomimicry in general as a concept, um, what do you think uh, the role that can uh, biomimicry uh, play in the developing world and uh, in countries and developing countries? Um, because as you said, like it was interesting actually because like it took so long before looking at nature, as you said, like before getting to that. Maybe lots of other patterns like can be directly taken from nature so we don't go around before getting to the right solution. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think one thing I want to call out, and it's, it's part of our definition of biomimicry that we started with, is biomimicry is an emerging discipline of an ancient practice. Right? And so we're only now formalizing it in, um, I've been working in the field for 23 years, and we're only now like, you know, giving it a name and figuring out how do we teach it and what are the rubrics and what are the frameworks and what are the tools and methodologies, the definition of a discipline. But as long as humans have walked the planet, we have asked our fellow organisms in every ecosystem that we've entered, how do you live here? How do you do this? 
And I think it's important to both honor that, but to recognize that we actually haven't lost that ability. So, uh, you know, I'm so grateful for Pete and his lab and, and the SEM and figuring out these details and how can we replicate that and how can we mimic it so that we can build a better, uh, you know, paint or dye um, or not, you know, a different alternative to a dye. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to have the PhD and the lab and all these research dollars to get lessons from nature. Um, and and you, you can go for a walk in the woods with a question in mind, um, just as we've always done, uh, and used our observational skills to sort of, at a minimum, say, how is nature doing that from what I can tell? you know, and my limited ability to understand this system relative to um, how we're doing it in our world, right? Like in the human built world. And could I find some better um, resonance and, and bring my actions and my pathways closer to that? So like regenerative agriculture is a great example. I mean, there's so much to be learned from the land and the local species and the local patterns and pathways that can guide us to how we ought to be planting, growing, you know, doing things here. And so I believe that in the developing world, there's two incredible opportunities. One is just reconnecting with nature, which we all need to do, and going out and asking those questions. And there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, right? There's a ton of low-hanging fruit that we can tap into. But there's also one of the beauties of nature as inspiration is that it's not locked up in a patent database, like, right? It's available and open for everyone. Most of the biological knowledge that we have is in journals, it's in, it's in books, it's in places that anybody can access and, and then thus learn from. So it's not, it's not something that you necessarily have to have money um, and a lot of infrastructure to to get it. And so I think that, um, you know, in terms of a practice, biomimicry is accessible to anybody who wants to quiet their cleverness and put themselves in that space where they can go out and become students um, of nature. And then, of course, there's, you know, oodles of interesting technologies and applications of things that, that can apply. And they don't actually have to be just technology types of applications. So for example, we're working on a project where we're asking the question of how does nature, you know, how does nature recycle everything? And there's guidelines, you know, we can use this thing that just says, oh, nature recycles, we should recycle. But no, there's actual like lessons and details into, well, how does nature collect, you know, and how does nature process and how does nature redistribute? And some of those collection lessons we're actually applying on a project in South Africa now to figure out how can we build closed loop systems um, for some of the technology or some of the products that are that are being used so that, you know, one, they don't obviously don't end up in the rivers or whatever it might be, but more importantly, how do those, how do we close those loops in a really detailed sort of meaningful kind of way? Um, so that there's, yeah, there's no shortage of, of possibilities and things that, that can be learned. Yeah. It's, it's very good to hear. And actually like, um, uh, what I really enjoy with what you just said is that actually like we're talking about something that is like really linked to the, old ancient common sense of like going outside looking how things are, are, are actually happening in nature and trying to apply it so actually it's something that can be very simple and very much from the the day-to-day -day, right uh, as a way of people in, involving biomimicry in their in their lives right right i mean going back to like you know pete was talking about the the relationship between color and another species that is interacting so i i often think of flowers and their pollinators right and one of the things that is a big lesson that comes from that that if you just spend time observing is that there's a tuning of the signal of the flower the color of the flower the shape of the flower the smell of the flower to the antenna literally the antenna often in most pollinators and that tuning is a co-evolved process and we need to match the signal to the antenna 
right there is a deep lesson where we can ask ourselves as emitters of signals, am I putting signals out in the shape, the form, the tone, the language, the level of understanding of the antenna of who I need to hear that signal? Right? And we know that it often goes like that, right? Any argument with your, your significant other is usually like this, right? Because the signal and the antenna haven't matched. And so there are even those, those lessons that can be really profound for the work we do in the world that could come from a simple observation of, look how well those bees and flowers are, are doing a dance together. Right? And yeah, and aggregating it and sharing it like between each other's right sharing those uh, those good knowledge uh, between each other's um uh, we are getting to the the end of uh, of our of our time um i i wanted to uh to let you guys maybe a bit if you have a, a question for diana or vice versa yeah, so thank you, Florian. The, the one area that would be useful just to touch upon, and Dana, your experience is, um, is really valuable here, is um, I, over the years I've been asked to contribute and, and talk to companies here and there uh, about the possible applications to, um, in their areas that the appearance work we've done and which others have done in the field, of course, um, can be applicable. But one thing that I'm minded to call out a little bit is, and, and your take is, is really valuable, um, bioinspiration, biomimetics is really sexy and it sells and sustainability is associated with it, I think, you know, implicitly. Um, the, the impression I get is that some companies are hooking their products on the biomimetic train really without any real tangible biomimetic component associated with it you know at best it would be a stretch um, certainly a few of the companies with which i've interacted uh, not formally it's sort of that that's been the aroma dana i just wondered w wondered what we can do to to make sure that companies that are that sell their product on bioinspiration principles on biomimetic principles actually do so in a legitimate way mm -hmm. that's yeah that's a great question we call it let's just like greenwashing we call it bio washing right you know it's a and um you know there's a couple of aspects to that we we talk about three essential elements to biomimicry um, they're the emulate piece and part of the emulate piece is actually being true to the biology like don't don't be making up stuff right like you actually need to know and understand what the organism is doing or the system biological system is doing um, and the biology needs to be true uh, the second is to reconnect like there's actually that connection of of recognizing that we are nature and all of these components need to be connected together. And then the third is their ethos. Like there needs to be an ethos that's involved. It needs to be, you know, BASF has a, a, um, a spray that works like the Lotus effect to help clean surfaces, but it's made out of like just really nasty, toxic chemicals. And I'm pretty sure the Lotus would not approve <laughs> of its use of its technology in that way. So um, we, when, when Biomimicry 3.8 works with companies, we bring all three of those to the door and, and we, we require that they become the work that we do. And we won't work on a project if they refuse to include all of those. Um, and so that's a standard that, that we hold. Um, we haven't, we've, we've actually decided there's two things we don't want to do. We don't want to get into the business of policing like, I mean, well, it's a never ending process. Um, I do have some assignments, for example, that I give in, in my graduate program where I ask them to go find examples of bio washing and leave some comments like, no, that's bullshit. That's not actually bio, you know, biomimicry. But I think it's what we do and what we've chosen is to shine the spotlight on what are the best examples, like who is doing it right and to not give any attention, any bandwidth to the nonsense that's out there. So that's one active choice. Um, 
the other thing that we also have opted to not do is to not do any sort of label or any sort of certification. Like this is authentically biomimicry because sadly, I don't actually think there's any example out there that meets all of life's principles. You know, for example, in order for it to be manufactured at scale and with cost and all this, then there's all sorts of compromises that are made. And, um, and as a result, it, it, we, we, we continue once again, over and over again, to fall short of what nature has been able to accomplish in a way that, that um, meets those same sorts of standards. But what we do do is call out the companies that are trying. Right? Like that they're trying to do it well and they're trying to, um, to, to, to be respectful and honorable of the system. Like, you know, those are the ones that we want to give attention to and acknowledge the efforts uh, that, they're, that they're making. But you're exactly right. I mean, in some ways I could put a positive spin on it, which it's a good sign, right? Like it means that people are paying attention. There's enough people paying attention that they want to l- jump on this bandwagon. But yeah, it's more like a little bit like you may with a, with a kid, ignore bad behavior and and highlight the you know good behavior and to have these kinds of conversations as many places as we can and say how do we do this in a way that is that that the organism or the biological system would gladly hand over their ip right like they would gladly be proud of what we've done because we've done right by them Um, we've been trying to develop a program that we call innovation for conservation It's kind of like a royalties for habitat where if you've made money off of, say, the morpho butterfly uh, using the lessons of the morpho, then you ought to be contributing to protecting morpho habitat. Like that's that's the Thanksgiving piece. Like let's let's and part of ethos for us is coming from a place of of gratitude of thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for sharing it. and I hope we did right by you. I hope we emulated it in the best way that we possibly could. And can we show our appreciation by protecting your home um, so that you can continue to, you know, we, the wellspring of ideas can continue to be, to come forth. And um, that's the way we frame it. I don't know that there's much more than we can do. I guess the other piece that's a little bit around that, part of Ask Nature, our database, asknature.org, that our nonprofit is has developed, is uh, it is out there to share as many biological ideas as we can. But there's a hidden uh, intention in that: is if the biology in a design context is already in the public sphere, then it can't be patented because it's already in the public, and then therefore it opens it up for somebody else to really learn from it and really do well with that and do it right, right? Or do it better than perhaps somebody who's not doing it right. So um, that's some of the ways that we've thought about it over the years, but I I wish there was an easy answer. I wish it was a way to really like, you know, ban them. No, you can't talk about it that way, but that's that's the way we're looking at it. And we talked here about companies, but actually, like um, in the case of individuals, I think it's where there is a huge opportunity of, uh, and actually, I, I'd like to, to hear from you on that, is like, uh, like, how could we apply this to education and help, like, how could it be part of actually, like, um, be one of, part of the solution, actually, uh, to fight climate change, uh, through like biomimicry, microeducation that people can learn and share knowledge uh, that they are taking from nature and that can apply to communities and to urban design and to the way that we behave in a, in like small scales, uh, regenerative villages. So that's like opening up a second hour of a podcast with a question like that. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, part of my work in the world, I made a choice um, 
back in 2008 that in order to get more biomimicry happening in the world, we needed more people practicing biomimicry. And in order to get more people practicing biomimicry, we needed to train them. Well, how are we gonna train them? Well, I don't know, I'll just start a training program. <laughs> and so I did. And, um, and I launched the biomimicry professional program and the biomimicry specialist program and of course now the master's at ASU and now an undergraduate certificate and you know all with the goal but it isn't so much about you know us getting these people trained but these people that are trained can now do all of this other work in the world right and so you know there's biomimicry south africa and we've got four or five of our graduates that are doing on the ground education there and there's biomimicry brazil and there's biomimicry netherlands and there's biomimicry hong kong and you know i mean like, like all over the world and all these individuals and you know in the master's degree i have teachers and and other types of educators that are that are trying to figure out, you know, how to do this, right? So it's, it is that networking that you're talking about. And it, it's, there's no, this is n no silver bullet. It's just lots of little, you know, activities that grow and grow and grow. I mean, nature is an emergent phenomenon, right? The, the, the thriving ecosystem that is the planet is an emergent phenomenon of lots of great, well-tuned ideas and that's the work that has to happen in the world so for climate change regenerative there's no one magic silver bullet like this is going to solve all of climate change it's going to draw it down um you know we have to do this and this and this and this and this and we have to celebrate every single every single one and have everyone work towards that you know I think, Florian, the only thing I, I would add to that wonderful description data presented is, again, a slightly more tightly focused um, with respect to education and communicating science. So, you know, for several years, I used to try to teach um, interference of light to, to primary school kids, to secondary school kids, high school, um, to university people. And, you know, and the ones that were naturally intrinsically motivated, you know, would work hard and they'd get it. The ones that were on the edge, or maybe it was my delivery, you know, it just didn't go down. You know, as soon as I started to frame the discussion with, okay, look at this beautiful naturally evolved specimen. Now let's let's talk about it. Let's let's examine it. It, a butterfly, a, a beetle, a snake integument, whatever, it enabled me to to capture an audience with respect to science communication that previously for the what might otherwise be described as a fairly dry you know central core physics subject i was able to capture these these people and they listened and they wondered because of the the awe they they felt with respect to the appearances they were seeing um so I said at the beginning, I do a lot of science communication, you know, and without, I could talk about interference and light and photons and everything the way any optical scientist would talk, but without these things to support and to create a stage, you know, a lot of those presentations would just fall flat and they'd go nowhere. And if I've, if I've been able, and colleagues like me have been able to achieve anything with respect to science communication about the stuff that we do in, in bioinspiration and biomimetics, it's because of the door that's opened into these young minds or, or middle-aged or older minds that otherwise would keep their door closed because science is too hard, because science involves mathematics and, I, you know, and I've never done mathematics and I don't enjoy it. Well, you don't need to. You know, a few basic fundamental ideas will, will open their minds to the world and that's proven possible because the platform with which these things can be presented in a very palatable and attractive way is a bio-inspiration. Let's look at these natural systems and just be amazed by them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very inspiring what you said because I totally agree. I think it's, uh, you need to go back to like real stuff, like real things and like being like, as Dana said, like go in the nature, take a walk, like look at these things then people get inspired. Then they may, they may get to the science level. But if they can already feel it, then they will see it. Yeah, nobody looks at a morpho butterfly and goes, oh, that's ugly, or oh, that's boring, right? Like, and, and so it becomes an incredible place to start. Yeah. 
that's uh, that's a good way to look at it and actually it's uh, that's exactly uh, uh, the approach that that we like to to uh, to think of when uh, when thinking of uh, of how to to use that knowledge and share it uh, as as widely as possible so thank you so much uh, for your time uh, thank you for for being with us today it's uh, very exciting to hear uh, all this uh, deep knowledge about biomimicry, about its application and how we could uh, use it for good, right? For planet regeneration. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for your time. Pete, thanks for joining us on such short notice. I'm glad that we've been able to connect. And It's been a, a real pleasure and a delight to speak with you, Dana, and speak with you, Florian, and to contribute to this really interesting event. Thank you. Excellent. All right, thank you. Take care, everybody.